join your hearts with mine in prayer. God of grace, oil the hinges of our hearts' doors that they may swing easily open to welcome you. Amen. For 40 days, Jesus wandered in the wilderness, inhabited that arid landscape without food or shelter to speak of. He was accompanied only by the desert-dwelling creatures and by that ruinous tempter, the devil, weighed down by nothing more than his own thoughts and the lingering memory of his dunking in the Jordan River, how he must have longed for another drenching in the Jordan's depths during those many weeks in the desert. I wonder where his thoughts took him as his stomach growled and his shoulders baked in the sun, whether he used that time to develop a strategy for his ministry, to chart a clear course to map out his miracles, or whether his thoughts were too muddled by hunger so that he could only think of one thing, bread. We are entering the season of Lent, when we are called to repent from sin. The current agreed upon list of the seven deadly sins, according to Wikipedia, include pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Not a bad list, but it strikes me that Impatience is not included, and I wonder whether it should be, at least for me. The last time I developed a craving for chocolate, I got in my car and drove the 0 0.3 miles to Trader Joe's, <laughs> adding carbon to the atmosphere, congestion to the roads, denying my body 10 minutes of fresh air and exercise just to get there a tiny bit faster. If I had the ability to snap my fingers and turn the stones in my backyard into chocolate, I would have done that instead, thereby eliminating the weight altogether. Impatience is a pernicious thing. It masquerades as efficiency. Why wouldn't you feed yourself, if you could, without the added labor? Just think how much more you could do, how many more mouths you could feed, if all it took was a wave of the hands. But the quick fix is rarely the faithful one. It may get you what you want in the short run, but at what cost? When I rush, I'm more likely to speak harshly, drive dangerously, hurt someone's feelings, abuse my body, or neglect it, harm the earth, or miss the quiet voice of God. Now, it may be that impatience is not always a bad thing. We should be impatient for our justice impatient for peace, impatient to see God's beloved community lived out among us. If impatience spurs us to creative action and to greater acts of kindness and courage, well, that seems to me to be a good thing. But even then, we cannot snap our fingers and transport ourselves to the finish line any more than Jesus could skip over those 40 days. There are no shortcuts on the road to transformation, personal or communal. To become wise, we must study. To build a relationship, we must spend time together. To change a habit, we must gradually rewire our brains. 
to dismantle anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, we must listen long and unflinchingly to our neighbors. To grow a garden, we must persistently tend the soil. This, friends, is the unavoidable truth. The journey, every journey, takes us smack dab through the middle of a wilderness. What we do during our time there matters as much as where it leads us. Now, this may not feel like good news. And Lent may not fill you with joyful anticipation or pleasant nostalgia the way that Christmas and Easter can do. At first glance, it looks like Lent demands a lot more of us. Repentance, sacrifice, self-denial on the way to self-improvement. Maybe it's good for us, like cauliflower or 30 minutes on a treadmill, but it's got nothing on a brand new baby gurgling in the straw or on a shining vision of Christ at sunrise framed by a field of vibrant lilies. As liturgical seasons go, Lent has a reputation for being a total downer by comparison. We mostly prefer our appetites sated. But here's the thing. Neither Christmas nor Easter is all bright lights and lilies either. Before the baby, there was the labor. And before the resurrection, there was the cross. Easter begins in the dark corners of a cave. <clears throat> there is no life without struggle, no coming fully alive without something dying. At least the season of Lent is honest about this. On day one of Lent, Ash Wednesday, a smudge of ash on the forehead reminds us that we are mortal, i.e. that we will die, that we are dying. Mary Ludy calls Ash Wednesday the moment when we get our terminal diagnosis. If you've never done it, had your head marked with ashes, I recommend it. There is something about confronting our own mortality, about recognizing that, in the words of the late rock star Jim Morrison, no one here gets out alive, that can be both sobering and free. I'm dying. Well, so that's settled. The question becomes, what do I do in the meantime? Maybe that's what Jesus was thinking about in the wilderness. How can I wring all the life out of the years that I have while I have them? How can I fill them with hope and joy and also convey that, that sense of urgency that we have work to do? How can I keep my priorities straight and help others to do the same? Because this I know, bread is not enough. We do not live by bread alone. There is the positive power of the wilderness. It puts things in perspective. When I'm feeling profoundly vulnerable outside my comfort zone, it's a little easier in those moments to remember. There is one God, and I'm not it. I can eat or not eat, but only God can give me life. Once I get clear about what's not my job, I can move on to contemplate what is my job. And so Jesus quotes Moses when he says to the devil, 
Worship the Lord your God and serve only God. Later on, he would put it another way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. That, my friends, is our job. So what if these 40 days in the wilderness are a chance to deepen that love, to strengthen those ties that bind us to the one who created us from the dust of the earth? What if the journey is a gift, not something to avoid or work around or get past, but something to embrace, struggle and all? When I was pregnant with my second son, I read a study that told me that women in other parts of the world talk very differently about labor compared to women in the United States. We are much more likely to describe the intense pain of labor in negative terms as terrifying and even to be avoided at all costs. Think about every labor you've ever seen depicted in the movies. By contrast, this study showed that women in Scandinavia more often describe their contractions as uncomfortable rather than painful because they think of labor in positive terms. These intense muscle spasms, they are a sign that the body is working to bring forth new life. It is hard, really hard, but it's also beautiful. I wonder whether we could think of our journey through the wilderness like that, as an invitation to patiently, persistently bring forth new life in our lives. Our ancestors in the faith understood that repentance includes two aspects, both equally important, mortificatio and vivificatio, dying and coming alive, moving in a new direction. And my preaching professor, Dr. Dow Edgerton, whom some of you have met and who describes himself as a happy Calvinist, he says, how could you not love a season of repentance? Because it's about stopping being dead. It's about stopping being bound by the powers of death. We can't shed those bonds on our own, but we know who can. The giver of bread, the Lord of life. Now, I don't know exactly when it happened for Jesus, whether in the womb or at the moment of his birth or as he lay in his mother's arms or as the waters closed over his head in the Jordan or when he saw the skies open and a dove descend or as he sat on a sun-baked rock in the wilderness and confronted the devil, but it did happen. Jesus got clear, really clear, that there is but one thing that matters, and that is God alone, creator, redeemer, sustainer. God, the life maker, the life saver, the life shaper. Held up by that force, the force of that most powerful life-giving truth, Jesus was able to plant his feet and look the devil in the eye. Although his stomach ached with hunger, maybe because it ached with hunger. Jesus could think of only one thing, and that one thing was God, in whom we live and move 
and have our being. Why would you want to miss that? Why would you want to miss the wilderness? If the wilderness is where you find your footing, find the courage to confront the devils that torment you, whether your own torment comes in the form of bondage to alcohol or wealth or power or beauty or control or impatience masquerading as efficiency, why wouldn't you want to go where you might find the courage to break those bonds, to say to those devils, every one of them, you are not the boss of me. You I will not worship one minute more. I may not know exactly how this will all turn out, but I know that God has something better, something life restoring in store. Yes, this is hard. Sometimes really hard. But as I say to my children, we can do hard things. Because here's the good news. The Holy Spirit shows up. Was with Jesus all the way along. Remember the first verse? Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and led by the Holy Spirit, he went into the wilderness. The Holy Spirit never left him. And it doesn't leave us. There may be no shortcuts on this journey towards transformation, but that's okay, because God is in it for the long haul. And so sisters and brothers in Christ, this year, let us consider moving through Lent at a measured pace. Be patient. See what God might do with you, with us, whether we might just find the courage to stand firm, to look the devil right in the eye and say, it's not about you and it's not about me, it's about God. Here's the thing, individually, we may indeed be inadequate to this task, but we are more adequate together. And as Dr. Dow Edgerton says, if the Holy Spirit shows up, the odds are decisively in our favor. There may even be new life in store. Thanks be to God. Amen.